You are welcome to the K. Eisergei channel and storytelling, and here we go. David sat at the bar in a corner and sipped his beer. It was hot outside, and two or three drinks wouldn't hurt him. The workday ended today, barely started. And there was no work. The personnel officer came running with notices that the company was about to be downsized. There was something tricky about it, but it was more expensive to argue with the bosses. David thought that the owner of the enterprise was doing something wrong with their salaries, and he had long ago decided that it was time to leave. All the more so because there was a place to go. He is a qualified builder with all the specialties. In the midst of the downsizing, he wrote a statement, which the personnel officer dictated to him. The essence of it was that in connection with the notification of impending dismissal, due to redundancy, he gave his consent to the early termination of the labor contract with simultaneous payment of additional compensation in accordance with the labor code. The personnel officer paid special attention to dates. As a result, Friday was formally his last working day. Tomorrow was Friday, his last day of work. But he didn't have to go to work, because his work record book had been given to him today. In the meantime, David thought about how to tell his wife. Things had been bad at home for a long time. His daughter was married, living separately, and often called her parents. His son was studying at university and was rarely in town. In the summer he went somewhere to earn money with a student group. His wife, Elizabeth, worked as deputy chief accountant of a solid enterprise. She never admitted that her husband was a simple laborer and never showed it to anyone. Although David could talk the talk of any engineer. And the money he was making was pretty good. In addition to that, he also worked part-time at odd jobs. He did all kinds of repairs in apartments. Because of the stardom of his wife, who considered herself an intellectual, there was a certain cooling in their relationship. With each passing year, they grew farther apart. And when the children left their parents' nest, they began to live like neighbors in a communal apartment. Even sleeping in separate rooms. No, David brought up the issue of marital debt. Elizabeth replied that she didn't owe anyone anything. Only his money on paydays was regularly withdrawn by her. David tried to find ways to reconcile with his wife, but she considered him a loser who could not even graduate from university. Although, at one time, David left his studies to support his family and allow Elizabeth to finish her studies. And he left in his final year. As a result, he had an incomplete university degree. But he worked, took care of his daughter, and helped his wife finish university. But still, in his wife's opinion, he was a loser. He finished his beer and went home without hurrying. Elizabeth wasn't there yet, for the last three months, she was always late for work. But after connecting the dots, David concluded that Elizabeth was seeing someone. He tried to talk to her, but she refused to talk to him. Around 9 o'clock in the evening, the door slammed. Elizabeth came home. She went into the kitchen, turned on the kettle. She called David. He came over, and she said. On Saturday, our company is going on a barbecue at our recreation center. What's this got to do with me? Or you're letting me know you'll be away for two days with your lover at a barbecue. What are you talking about? What lover? You know best. You don't have to inform me. I'm informing you because you're coming with me. At the recreation center, we'll have our own room. The bosses want all the employees to be with their soulmates. You got it. And be warned, your refusal will not be accepted. David thought that Elizabeth was planning to make up with him, so she invited him to the barbecue. Maybe his conclusions about her cheating are wrong. He decided to take her up on her offer, and he said, I'll be ready on Saturday. What time are we leaving, and with what? We're taking two of our buses. We leave at 7 a.m. from our office. So we leave the house at 6 o'clock or 10 o'clock. In the morning Elizabeth went to work, David never told her that he had quit. He decided to devote the day to putting things in order. Elizabeth had long demanded that the tools be removed from the house. So he decided. He brought the car in, and he hauled all the tools out. Cleaned up the garage. 
In this way the whole day passed. Elizabeth came in late that evening. She said she'd gone shopping and brought a snack. Although the principal had promised a buffet there. On Saturday, Elizabeth walked into the room where David was sleeping, five minutes before his alarm clock rang, and said. Come on, get up. We have to get ready. Since everything had been ready since the evening before, they got ready quickly. For the first time in three months, David and Elizabeth had breakfast together. David didn't take much for himself, just the bare minimum. Knowing that they would have a separate room, he took a dark tracksuit. He also took an excellent camera with a powerful lens, having cleared the memory card beforehand. After breakfast, quickly clearing everything off the table, they moved out to the shuttle bus. It was a beautiful morning. After listening to the weather forecast for the weekend, David firmly rejected the idea that he should bring an umbrella. David did not look at what Elizabeth was taking with her, for his opinion was not to be taken into account. He only acted as a carrier. Elizabeth carried only one constant attribute, a woman's purse. We arrived at the rendezvous point. We loaded into the buses that had arrived. Elizabeth introduced David to some of her colleagues. By some fifth sense, David singled out Michael Igarevich and his wife Vera Viktorovna. When Elizabeth was introducing them, Michael looked at him with a studied, guilty look. And looking at the tenderness with which Elizabeth was talking to Igor, David put together the puzzle he had been trying to solve all these days. Unnoticed by the others, David took a few pictures of Michael and Elizabeth talking away from everyone. This did not escape the attention of Michael's wife, Vera. On the bus, Elizabeth and David's seats were next to Michael's and Vera's. Elizabeth turned slightly toward Igor and talked to him, discussing a project that involved both the accounting department and the department where Michael worked. Vera listened attentively, but did not enter the conversation. David was silent as well, staring out the window, where the woods flickered with fields. At the seating, David noted that there was some inequality here as well. The executives close to the director sat in the front. The director himself went to the barbecue in his company car. The regular employees of the company took the back of the bus. They drove for about an hour along the highway, then turned onto a country road, and through the forest, drove to the recreation center. And then they drove through the gates. The general manager was already there, he gathered everyone and proposed. My friends! Our recreation center has been idle for a long time. With the help of our economic department, the area has been relatively tidy. We're moving into two buildings. At the entrance to the main building, there is a list of who will be placed where. The third building has been partially renovated. It's still unoccupied. After that, I propose to gather at the sports ground by the outdoor pool. Our organizers have prepared an entertainment program for us. David and Elizabeth checked into a relatively nice room on the second floor, overlooking the recreation center. The room had two separate beds, a table, and two chairs. There was a built-in closet and a shower. Elizabeth quickly put her things on the shelves and ordered. Let's go to the pool. I note you're behaving yourself. You keep quiet, you don't show your hillbilly culture. All these years, my culture suited you. What happened now? You had to grow up. To improve. Like Michael Igarevich, for example. It's a pleasure to communicate with him. Okay, let's go. David took the camera and followed his wife. As they passed the dining room, David noticed that more than six cases of vodka had been brought in. There were five cases of fortified wine. He noted to himself that the party was going to be a big one. The more so because each couple, not knowing the extent of the party, had brought their own liquor. The organizers from among their employees entertained everyone until lunchtime. I must say that all their games and contests were a success. All this time, David watched his wife, not noticing that Vera Viktorovna was paying close attention to her. In the course of the contests, David and Vera, who were spectators, happened to be next to each other. Vera suddenly asked. Tell me, David, do you also know that they are having an affair? Who's having an affair? Michael and Elizabeth. No, but that's what I realized today. 
So what are you thinking of doing about it? I don't know yet, but I'd like to see proof of their affair. I have it. I can share them with you, but I don't carry them with me. What is this evidence? Their photos of their lovemaking sessions, mostly in the evenings after work. Pretty explicit photos, I'll tell you. But why do you need them? If for divorce, then in court you can specify the dissimilarity of characters, different views on life, lack of common interests. In addition, you can divorce, and through the registry office, let's say, in the administrative order, the main thing is the absence of common children and joint filing of the application. In the registry office, the motive for the termination of the marriage, in principle, is not clarified, and no one is interested. No, this is about the children. They're ad. Alts, and I'll almost certainly be blamed for breaking up the family, and Elizabeth, she's the injured party. She has a knack for twisting things around. I will divorce through the court, and the reason for divorce, I will specify adultery. But then in court, don't cite the source of your evidence of infidelity. And I also want to warn you. You'll soon be introduced to a young man named Dennis. He's from my husband's department. His task, as Igor has instructed, is to get you drunk tonight during dinner. Keep in mind. Getting me drunk to get rid of me? How do they plan to get rid of you? I'll get rid of them myself. I'll tell my husband I don't feel well and I'll take a sleeping pill, then I'll go to bed. And at 9 o'clock at night, my brother will come to pick me up in a car and wait for me at the gate. He's taking my things out of the apartment with a friend. Just so you know, the road to the left of the gate leads to the station. It's not far from here. I just don't know the train schedule. And further on, you have to go through the woods, two kilometers, there's a big village there. Are you leaving the apartment to your husband? The apartment? We have one room. It used to be a small dormitory. Now it's a breeding ground for alcoholics. I'm moving into my brother's apartment. He got married and he doesn't live in his apartment and he doesn't rent it to anyone. Three rooms in the center are empty. What about your brother? He lives in the suburbs. He has a cottage there. Does his wife have a cottage? No, he built it himself before he was married. If you're thinking of leaving tonight, I can give you a ride into town. Thank you for the offer. But I'll take the train. Just leave me your phone number so I can get the pictures from you. In case I need them. Toward evening, the grills were fired up, and for dinner we had some excellent kebabs. Beer kegs were brought out, vodka appeared on the tables. And yes, David was introduced to Dennis. Dennis immediately sat down with him, and while Elizabeth and Igor danced, he poured. While Vera was sitting at the table, David didn't drink a single shot. Although Dennis, who was already drunk, thought that he had poured almost half a liter of vodka into him. Pretending to be very intoxicated, David began to fall asleep, which pleased Tatiana very much. She ordered it. Michael, Denise. Take my collective farm drunk to his room. Dennis, enthusiastically, began to drag David, assisted by a subdued Michael. They got David to the bed. They accompanied Vera, who said that she had taken a sleeping pill, arguing that she had a headache and needed to lie down. Because she was up too early. As soon as everyone left, and the door closed, David got up, and went to the balcony, went down to the balcony a floor below, where he jumped to the ground, and lurked in the bushes. He had a perfect view of the entire lighted hall where the dance was taking place. There was no one on the street. Through the emergency exit from the enclosure, came Vera, who walked to the gate. As she passed by, David said. Good luck. David, have you left the room yet? What's there to walk down the balcony? Okay, good luck with that. I'm told my key is in room 14, in the building where no one lives. It's on the first floor. The windows face that way. Thank you. David quickly moved to the opposite side of the enclosure. Soon a light came on in one of the rooms. Feeling like a scout, David silently climbed to the first floor balcony and peered through the window. Through the gaps in the curtains, he could see Elizabeth kissing Igor. 
The window was open, and David placed his phone on the frame, in which he turned on the voice recorder. At the same time, he took pictures of what was going on in the room through a gap in the curtains. After half an hour, he got tired of it all and noticed that the lovers were not active. He realized that they had simply fallen asleep after drinking quite a lot. Quietly pushing the balcony door, David found it unlocked. He entered the room, collected all the lovers' clothes, and left the room through the door, which was also unlocked. After pondering how to thank the lovers, David walked to his suite where a sculpture stood and decorated it with clothing items. He wet the knots beforehand and tightened them thoroughly. On the bench, David found Dennis asleep. The boy had miscalculated his strength in trying to get David drunk. Dennis slept with his shoes off. His fancy shoes were standing by the bench. David decided that he should thank Dennis too, so he sent his shoes into the fountain. The fountain didn't work, but there was water in it. After that, David left the territory, and in half an hour, was at the station. The station had a small waiting room. There were two people in the audience. A woman in her thirties and a drunk man. David looked at the timetable and saw that the nearest train was at 6 a.m. The night was to be spent in the waiting room. At that time, a scandal broke out between a man and a woman. As David realized, they were not a couple. It was just a bored, drunken man who started hitting on a woman. David had had enough of it, so he went over to the drunkard, lifted him off the bench by the pecs, and sharply put him back down. He exclaimed. Man, what are you doing? I was just kidding. I wasn't. And I'm in a bad mood. You won't be here till morning with me. No, I've got a train. I took a ticket. I wanted to meet a girl. What train, to the city? No, out of town. I have to go the other way. Then go. The man got up and quickly went to the platform. Young lady, are you on this train too? Thank you. I'm like a rabbit. I'm the only one meeting the train. A friend's coming in from out of town for a visit. I'm stuck. The next train isn't until 6 a.m. No, 6 a.m., that's on weekdays. Tomorrow is Sunday. The first train wouldn't arrive until 9 o'clock. At that time, the girl's phone rang and she answered it. Raya, I'm listening to you. You're on your way up? I mean, what do you mean no? She disconnected the phone and said with chagrin. My friend's not coming. She's late. And now I have to walk three kilometers through the woods by myself. Where do you live? There's a village down the road. I'll rent you a corner so you can spend the night, and you can take me home through the woods. I'm afraid to go alone. I can see I have no choice. You can sleep here in the waiting room. You know. If it's convenient for you, I won't refuse to spend the night. They left the station building and walked along the road. After a while, they entered the forest. It was really kind of uncomfortable out there. David struck up a conversation. Let me introduce myself, by the way. My name is David. What's your name? My name is Diana Yurievna. It's just Diane. Since we're already on a first-name basis anyway. And here's a flashlight. I brought two, one for a friend. Lighting their way, they moved along the night forest road. Isn't there another way? There is but it would be a detour of seven kilometers. And here, directly, only two. It's just that there's a river next to the village, wooden bridges. They can't hold a car. And a normal bridge can't be built, they say the banks are swampy. How did you get here? David thought for a moment and told me what had happened to him. Sarah said, I don't understand your wife. She just hasn't seen any real country boys. They're getting fewer and fewer. Now in our village, there's internet in every house. I lived in the city, too. No, I didn't get married there. I went to school, and then my mom got sick, so she was the only one left in my village. I had a good job in the city, but I lived in a rented apartment. I gave up everything, came to my mother, and have been here for 10 years. 
During that time, I became head of a kindergarten. Now there's only one problem, heating. The agricultural cooperative really helps. How could they not? It's their kindergarten. And the children of their employees. They bought pipes and radiators, but they can't install them. There are no specialists. Besides, they have summer, the busiest work in the period of mowing, reaping, and harvesting. And every summer day, they feed the winter. You know, Sarah, let's go to your garden tomorrow and take a look. I know a little about it. So, as they talked, they reached the bridges, crossed the bridge, and found themselves in the village. The streets were dark, but Sarah led David confidently down the wooden steps to her house. Finally, she opened the gate, and they stood in front of her house. In the dark, the house looked imposing. They went inside. Sarah suggested. Do you want to have dinner? Thanks, but I think I'm gonna go to bed. Just show me where. What about going to kindergarten? Sarah, everything stays in the village. Sarah made David's bed. He went to bed. He didn't fall asleep right away, he reasoned about how lucky he was today several times. Vera gave out a lot of information, and he decided on a wife. It was clear that he was no longer going to live with Tatiana, but he had nowhere else to live. Except in the garage where he kept his tools. The other problem is the kids. My daughters do soon. My son's construction team will soon be over and he will come to visit. Elizabeth was the first to wake up. She was lying on the bed, Michael snoring deafeningly beside her. She pushed him over. The snoring stopped. Michael, come on, get up. We need to get back to our room. We're kind of falling asleep here. I'm getting up. My head is killing me. Why didn't you turn off the lights? You said it would be more erotic that way. Where are my clothes? You threw them on the floor. They got up, started looking for clothes, made sure they were gone. Elizabeth, realizing that the clothes were gone, did not hesitate, wrapped herself in a sheet and went out. Michael followed, doing the same. It was blooming outside. As they approached their building, they s. Ah Dennis snoring on a bench. Nearby, on a sculpture group, we saw our clothes. All attempts to remove them were unsuccessful, as they were tied to the sculptures and the knots were wet. The only success they had was finding Elizabeth's room key in the clothes. Elizabeth grabbed him and fled into the enclosure. Annoyed, Michael turned his anger on Dennis, whom he began to beat with his fists. A distraught Dennis jumped up and began to cover his face from the beatings, screaming. Michael Egorevich, why? I did everything you said. Why did you tie my clothes to the statues? I didn't tie anyone up. I fell asleep on the bench. And my shoes are gone. Of course not, they're floating in the fountain. Elizabeth, meanwhile, slipped into her room, found the clothes she had prepared for the second day. Before that, looking around the room, she realized that her husband was not here. At the noise outside, staff members began to look out of their rooms. Someone identified the clothes hanging on the statues as belonging to Elizabeth and Igor. Quiet laughter was heard. From the third floor, from the balcony of the suite, the general director was watching. Michael realized that he had become a laughingstock and fled into the building. Asked the night clerk for a spare key to his room. He went in and found his wife gone. He connected everything in his mind what had happened, and realized that Dennis had been caught in the act for nothing. I wondered if David would know where Elizabeth had been last night, for he was a big man. But the door opened and addressed Elizabeth came into the room and asked. No wife either? As you can see. I don't understand. David was spiked with a bottle of vodka last night. How could he go anywhere? And where would he go out here at night? There's a station nearby. It's a long way to go. You're the one who dragged him to his room from the dining room. Still, I take it his things are gone. I don't even know what he had. I don't even know what he had. Why are you wearing wet bathing suits and no clothes? It's the only thing I got from the monument. I didn't bring any spare clothes. 
I'm gonna go see if he'll give me the memorial pants. I think my wife and your husband made us at those barbecues. And we're in for a rough time. I'm not giving him a divorce. Do you think he'll ask? Or are there laws that require him to live with you? Igor, he loves me. If I wag my finger at him, he'll be at my feet, just like you. You're a fool. I wouldn't be at your feet if Vera kicked me out. You were my entertainment. I wanted to give you to Dennis. That's why he drank your farm boy. Only he just passed out on his own. I believed you were sincere. I thought if it wasn't for our families, we'd have a future. Yeah, right. Only you left your husband to bunk with me, not to love me. We never existed. It was all about animal pleasure. I have to say, as a woman, you were a complete failure. And it was your choice, not mine. My choice is my wife, you're no match for her. A furious Elizabeth slapped Igor in the cheek. As a result, she got a decent manly fist bump, which caused Michael to fall. With that, Elizabeth left the room. As she left the room, Elizabeth began to realize what a foolish thing she had done to her marriage. She had loved David in her own way, but the children were grown and there were fewer worries. She had more free time. And she wanted to feel wanted and loved. She took David's love for granted. And then her eyes fell on Michael. He was younger than her. He said beautiful compliments. Elizabeth made some inquiries about him. Turns out he was a party animal. His assessment of her as a woman today shocked Tatiana. She wondered how he could appreciate her when it was only their third meeting tonight. And because she'd been drinking too much, she wasn't sure they'd had anything at all. She went to her room. She sat on the bed and started calling her husband's cell phone. But, as she expected, he didn't answer. The operator said stubbornly. The subscriber's phone is switched off or out of range. When she was convinced that her attempts were futile, Elizabeth threw the phone down. She decided not to call her daughter yet, she had to come up with her own version of what had happened. And I had to prepare something sensible for the meeting with my son. In general, it was urgent to get out of this base, but the bus would leave only in the evening. There was laughter outside. Elizabeth went out onto the balcony and saw that many of the employees, having woken up, had gone out onto their balconies and were watching Michael trying to untie the knots to retrieve his shirt and pants. He paid no attention to Elizabeth's holiday clothes hanging there as well. At the beginning of nine, everyone gathered for breakfast. In the dining room, there was only talk of the night's incident. As soon as Igor appeared there, everyone went silent. It was only there that many people saw a decent black eye. However, Dennis came into the dining room with beatings on his face. Barely recovered from last night's drunkenness, he poured a beer and drank it in small sips, enjoying it leisurely. Reasoning, he realized that it was the beer that had ruined him yesterday. He didn't know that when he had taken his eyes off the table yesterday, David had poured a glass of vodka into his beer glass. Then he pretended to drink the vodka himself. It was that rough that proved to be Dennis's undoing. Even more silence was caused by Elizabeth's appearance in the dining room. But she looked good, despite her headache, because she had spent time applying makeup. She went to the keg of beer, poured a large mug of beer, and sat down at a table away from Michael. Vodka and wine began to be brought to the tables, urging people to drink it all so that they wouldn't have to bring it back with them. In the morning feast, the discussion of the incident continued. The version that Elizabeth's husband caught her in an affair, beat Michael and Dennis, and then, together with Michael's wife, left the recreation center. David woke up around 9 o'clock. When he remembered where he was, he dressed quickly, made his bed, and went out into the hallway. There were some noises coming from the kitchen, indicating that someone was there. I went into the kitchen. Sarah was setting the table. When she saw him, she said. Good morning. It's good that you're awake. Let's have breakfast and then we'll go to kindergarten. Good morning. Is daycare open today? It's Sunday. People are out in the field today, so the daycare center is open. They were gonna make it 24-7, but they changed their minds. So are you working today? 
No. I was waiting for a friend, so I took the day off. After breakfast, Sarah and David went to the kindergarten. It wasn't far, on a paved road. David asked. What were we doing on wooden ramps last night? We came from the other side, and there's no asphalt. It ends 30 meters from my house. The then collective farm didn't have enough money for more. But they built a good kindergarten. They say that the chairman of the collective farm built the house for himself. But the main department for combating economic crimes got involved, and it turned out that the collective farm had built the kindergarten. After a while, Sarah said, well, here we are. David assessed the kindergarten building. He noted that it was in need of some cosmetic repairs. But overall the building looked good. The territory itself was clean. There were small children in the courtyard, swarming around a low slide. The teacher looking after the kids came up to them and reported. Sarah. I have 14 kids in my group today, and 10 in the next group. That's fine. And this is the heating specialist, he'll assess what needs to be done to repair it. If you have any questions, I'm in the groups, or in my office. Determining what the repairs required took a lot of time. David scrutinized the blueprints Sarah had given him, walked through the nursery with them, and finally gave his summary. The blueprints did not match what was actually done, and there were likely to be problems with the heating. I'm surprised the daycare was warm at all. I don't know, it was all before my time. And there was no one to show the drawings, and even less to compare them with what was done. The daycare center will have to be closed for a week while the heating is repaired, and I need help. I'll enlist staff to help, I'll pitch in. So it's gonna be women carrying the radiators? What do we do? We unloaded them ourselves. Well done. The weight of one section of batteries I've seen weighs 7 kilos. They're assembled 7 at a time. Total, 7 times 7 is 49 kilograms. In order to preserve the health of workers, there are maximum permissible norms for single lifting of heavy weights. Men, no more than 50 kilograms, and women, no more than 15 kilograms. I understand your enthusiasm, but everyone has to do their own thing. Let me go see the chairman. How far is it? Let's go together. The office is two doors down. Oh, great. I'll take the blueprints. I'm gonna have to rework this schematic. You can see here that it was calculated for a coal-fired boiler, but you have a gas boiler. I'll go to the chairman myself. What's his name? Pyotr Semyonovich. David went outside and walked in the direction indicated. He found the office and went in. There were no people in sight, so he followed the sign and found himself in the reception area. Through the reception area, went to the chairman's office. A man of his age was sitting there. Hello. Well, hello, who do you want? I'd like the chairman, Pyotr Semyonovich. Petika, are you there? David. It really is a small world. So you're here for the leader, huh? How did you even come to the village? I got here on a placement. The district needed engineers for construction. So they assigned them. Even though I was eager to go to the city. And then, I worked out my allocation, and now I'm no longer a civil engineer, but the chairman of the board. Hey, how about a cognac? No, thanks. No, I'm just doing business. You're probably right. It would be embarrassing in front of the workers, because I've got a dry law in place for the harvesting season, and I'd be drunk all of a sudden. Tell me what you want. David told Peter why he had come. He also told him what had happened to him. How he had met Diana, how he had volunteered to help her. Peter thought for a moment and said. David, I'll make a contract with you. Everything has to be official. The radiators and pipes, you'll get them on delivery notes. I have them in my warehouse, by the way. In addition, we need an estimate for this work. Look, I'm not a bureaucrat, but when the inspection comes, I'll get my pants pulled down. Well, get your men ready. I understand your demands, and they're fair. 
it'll be done by the book. I'll go to town and get everything I need, and I'll do an estimate. In fact, though, you need a project here. Why? Engineering networks are replaced, not one-to-one. -one. There will be changes in the scheme, diameters, material of pipelines, and a project is needed. But you'll have to pay for it. Don't worry, they won't charge much. Just let me know if I can act on behalf of the SPK. Let me hire you. And what, you'll send me to the field to pick spikelets for the men? No, I'll hire you as a heating engineer. You'll put all the cowsheeds on me? No cowsheeds, but the chicken coops, yes. Well, a couple or three more pigsties. Oh, thank you. I've been missing it. Okay, here's the deal. I'll come back in a week with a project. That soon? Your kindergarten is a standard kindergarten, which means that such projects already exist. You give me letterheads so that I can submit an application for the production of design and estimate documentation. I'll make up the outgoing numbers myself. Here you go. In an hour, I'm going into town for a meeting at the executive committee. I can give you a ride. I'll be there in an hour. David returned to the kindergarten, Sarah waited for him, asked. Did you get the deal? Yeah, it's settled. But it's not that simple. The estimate you have isn't enough. You need a project. But it can be done. Tell me something, you're gonna give me the corner. What do you mean? I got a job at the SPK, but I don't have a place to live yet. What are you gonna do? Repair the heating in the kindergarten. They discussed the subject of repairs some more, and David said. I'm going into town right now, so I'm picking up all the paperwork. I won't be back until next Friday. Would you mind if I put my car in your yard? I have an empty garage there, too. That's fine. I'll bring my tools. I'm afraid to leave them in town. David returned to the JVC board, and Peter was already waiting for him. He got into the car and they drove into town. Peter asked. And where will you live? Uh, I'm staying with the head of the daycare center. Diane? I approve. She's a good woman. Her house is in good repair, even though the owner hasn't been there for a long time. Her parents are dead. Her brother died in an accident saving people. And her father was a model worker. He knew how to do everything. He built his house like a Tarek. The whole village went to see his house. And the bathhouse is great. They don't make them like that nowadays. How do you know? It's my job to know everything about everybody. Where should I drop you off in town? I'm thinking the garage district. I'll check on the car. You're gonna sleep there? I've got everything set up in there. I've even got canned goods. I've got to pack up my tools and load them in the car. Did you talk to your wife? No, I haven't even turned my cell phone on. They're probably just leaving the recreation center right now. Elizabeth got on the bus, to the quiet laughter of her co-workers. Most of them were already drunk. Michael got on the bus. His clothes were dry, but they were badly wrinkled. Dennis, with lights under his eyes, was helped into the bus. He couldn't hold on to the seat and lay down in the aisle. They decided not to touch him, to let him sleep it off until the city. Elizabeth spent the whole drive wondering what she would do to her husband for embarrassing her like that at the company barbecue. The drive dragged on for a long time, but finally arrived. She quickly grabbed her things, said goodbye to everyone, and walked to the shuttle bus. Twenty minutes later, she was standing at the door of her apartment. At first she rang the bell, but no one opened the door. Then she took out her keys, opened the door, and found herself in the apartment. I wanted to curse at my husband, but suddenly realized he wasn't home. Everything was still in its place. The husband never came home. She went into the kitchen, sat down at the table, and wondered what her mistake had been. She had originally thought David was an underachiever, a sodbuster. And now the farm boy was getting back at her for everything. 
No, she hadn't cheated on him before. What happened now with Igor, she didn't consider it cheating. It was just that one day she wanted to try to look at her life outside her family. She wanted to have some freedom from her husband. She wanted to feel loved and wanted by someone other than her husband. She already knew that he loved her and would do anything for her. That said, she wasn't going to leave him. There were too many reasons why she couldn't. She planned to grow old with her husband. Raise grandchildren with him. Her plan was to flirt for a few months. And that's when Michael came along. He was well-read, could speak beautifully. And most importantly, intelligent and courteous. But, as the incident at the Shashlik showed, he was a beast. He wanted to offer it to his employee Dennis. At the same time, they had only had two full-fledged meetings before that day. She didn't like Michael as a man, but she hoped that he would improve in the future. At the recreation center, he and she just got drunk and passed out. In general, ashamed in front of the whole team. But shame is not smoke, it doesn't eat your eyes. I'll have to be patient. All those years of having a career and then suddenly giving it all up. And anyway, wherever she goes to work, those kebabs will haunt her for a long time to come. But she'll get her revenge on Igor. But first, she's gonna get her jerk of a husband back. David, he did it out of emotion, but he's not going anywhere. I just don't know why he didn't show up at home. The fact that he didn't pick up his clothes was a clear sign that he'd show up soon. I figured I'd stop by his work tomorrow and make him come home. David was sitting in the garage. He had planned tomorrow, and was now sitting at the table, waiting for his phone to charge. The table wasn't empty, since he'd planned to spend a week in the city, he'd gone to the mall and bought some groceries that didn't need to be cooked. Tonight he had a fine dinner, and indifferent to alcohol, David bought himself a couple of bottles of cognac. He decided, in this way, to celebrate the beginning of a new life. He didn't even think about restoring his relationship with Tatiana. Apparently, for him, it really was from love to hate, one step, and it was done. David took a small piece of cheese and carefully placed it near the hole in the wall he had discovered. Pondering who would come to him, a rat or a mouse. The phone charged. He picked it up, looked at it. There were a bunch of texts from his wife. A lot of unanswered calls. Also, calls not only from Elizabeth, but from unknown numbers. Apparently, the wife was trying to call from other phones. A few calls from my daughter. Thought I'd call her back. Lisa, hi. I see you called? My phone was dead. I just charged it up. Hey, Dad. I called to check on you, and you're taking hacks? What do you need? Our faucet is dripping. My husband says we have to file a complaint with the Housing and Repair Association. Can't he fix it himself? He did. Wrapped a rag around the faucet so the water wouldn't drip loudly, now it drips quietly. Are you staying home? Of course I am. Where would I go with a belly? I'm going to have a baby soon. Okay, I'll come by tomorrow morning and do it. Mom didn't call? You know she never calls me. She thinks my husband's out of the world. That he thinks differently than everyone else. Dad, he's a computer programmer. And she doesn't think she has anything to talk about with him or me. I see. How are you feeling? Great, Kostya buys everything I want. He made the nursery beautiful. And you say he can't do anything. Dad, he hired a designer, he drew up options for the nursery. The company came in and did the work. Kostya just paid the bill. Why didn't he do that with the faucet? So you can't hear the sound of the drops now. I see, wait for me tomorrow. After his daughter's call, David called back an old comrade with whom he had once studied at university. His companion answered. Yes, I'm listening to you. Tyson Androjevic, good evening. It's David. Oh, my God, David. And it's so official. I hear you're doing well, you've become a director. A big man. And whose fault is that to you? With your skills, you'd be a minister by now. 
alas, I've given everything to my family. I have a daughter about to give birth to a grandson, a son at our university. Where are you? I quit the firm I worked at for over 20 years. Finally. I told you a long time ago, quit them. So I quit. And I'm going to divorce my wife. What happened? Well, let's not talk on the phone. I'm home alone now. My wife is staying at her mother's, and she won't be home until tomorrow. You know the address, I hope I don't have to remind you. I'm just around the corner. I'm in the garage. Wait. 20 minutes later, David entered Tyson's apartment. I told you right away. Tyson, I'm sorry, but in addition to memories, I have a favor to ask of you. David, I'm gonna do everything I can for you. I need an approved project for a major overhaul of the heating of a kindergarten for 100 seats. For a rural area, from a gas boiler? Yes, that's the one. We have such a project, we'll do it for you. I'll help you get approval. But I'm not doing it for free, it's all gonna be paid for. So I brought the paperwork. We should take into account that some eagles had already re-welded the heating there, and now everything has to be redone. And they sold them used pipes. They're as thick as paper. We have to change everything. And who will do the work? I will, and with those whom Pyotr Semyonovich will give to help. Is that our Petya? Yes, that's him. He's the chairman of the SPK now. I'll help Pete. He could have come to me himself. He can't, he's in the middle of harvest. All right, come into the kitchen. We'll sit down, tell me what's going on with your wife. David sat down at the table, Tyson poured, they drank, and a friendly conversation began, two old friends. Toward the end of the meeting, Tyson said. I warned you about Elizabeth's stardom, didn't I? You thought she'd change. And because of that, you and I didn't see each other much. She thought our whole class was losers. I remember that. But I was young then. Oh, well. Listen, why do you want to work for the SPK? Come work for me. I'll hire you as a technician. Your education is more than enough. You read the blueprints like an open book. Dim, I promised Petra, and I'm the head of the kindergarten. I see. Tell you what, you come to my place tomorrow afternoon. Before lunch, go to the address I'll give you. You find Arthur, you tell him it's from me. He'll give you a major heating overhaul. It's inexpensive. And on a job like this, in a week. Negotiate the price with him and discuss it with Peter. Now, come on, stay with me tonight. No, I have a place to stay. You have to work in the morning, but I can sleep. So sleep, what's the problem? And your wife will be here in the morning. That's okay, I'll warn her. No, thanks. I'll see you tomorrow. Besides, to be honest, I had plans of my own in the morning. No matter how much Tyson urged David to stay, he said goodbye and left. He went to his garage. There, locking the doors, he checked for cheese at the entrance to the mink. The cheese was gone. David broke off another piece and put it back where he had eaten it. Afterward, he settled in for the night. Elizabeth woke up, and remembering the time limit, quickly got ready, and 40 minutes later, she was at David's work. While waiting, she stopped at the bulletin board and learned that David had been fired. Walked into HR and asked. Ah, uh, good morning. Can you tell me when David was fired? Friday was his last day of work. Tell me, where did he go to work? We don't know that. Who are you, exactly? I'm his wife. Well, you should ask your husband where he went to work. And we've got some downsizing going on. Although the director was very unhappy that he was fired. He was cursing at those who had drawn up the downsizing lists. So we can't help you. Elizabeth left the office and ran to her workplace. She got there just in time. She went to her office, grabbed the paper she had prepared, and went to the chief accountant's office. She was on excellent terms with the chief accountant. 
the chief accountant regarded her for her persistence and knowledge. When Elizabeth entered her office, Ida greeted her with an exclamation. Hello, slut. Did they tell you? Come on, there's a lot of excitement here. The director is laughing non-stop. Remembering how Igor won back his clothes from the monument. But for some reason he left your clothes behind. What did your husband say? Did he like the kebabs? He didn't tell me anything. I guess he did all that. And left the house. But I guess he's not going anywhere, he'll come for his clothes. Even though he quit his job. That's when Michael walked into the office. Ida Matveyevna, I'd like to sign a bypass. You're quitting? What else can I do when I've been dishonored like this? What about your wife? My wife packed up and moved out. To her lovers? No, to her brother's apartment, I think. But I'm not supposed to be there. She suggested we meet tomorrow at the registry office to file for divorce. What about tomorrow? It's a day off. Yeah, well, they work on Saturdays. Where are you going now? I don't know. Maybe I'll go back home to my parents. At this time, David was finishing loading his car with his belongings. He waited until Elizabeth left for work in the morning, gathered his clothes, some of his belongings, and loaded them into the car. On the table in the kitchen was a note from Elizabeth addressed to him. He didn't read it, but put down his note, in which he indicated. Elizabeth, I picked up my things. If you forgot something, it's not critical to me, just throw it away. Don't look for me or call me. When I'm ready to talk, I'll call you myself. David. David moved his stuff out. Took him two runs. Stacked it all up in the garage. After that, I went to my daughter's house. Knowing what kind of faucet and sink they had, he stopped by the plumbing store and bought a new faucet and filter, a flow-through multi-stage. He also had the necessary tools with him for the installation. His daughter greeted him happily and offered him breakfast. She said. Daddy, mom always hated to cook. The way you cooked always tasted better. She's probably still making you cook now. Not anymore. I don't cook for her. Do you guys share a table or something? We share a table, and we share a room. Now, let me get this straight. She had a boyfriend at work, but I happened to find out about it. When? She invited me to a kebab party on a company weekend. They decided to get me drunk so I wouldn't interfere with their lovemaking. So, what, you're drunk? No, of course not. But I can give you the audio I recorded on my phone. There's also some good quality video I shot on my camera. Are you gonna watch it? I'll listen to what's on my phone, but I won't watch what's on my camera. I think that's enough for me. You listen to it while I take care of the crane. Dad, it's just a gasket that needs to be replaced. Daughter, I've wanted to put in a nice modern faucet for you for a long time. But you always told your husband he'd do it himself. I have nothing against him, but his reasoning is, don't do it yourself, trust a specialist. And he doesn't have time to trust a specialist. I'm a specialist, so I came on my own. My daughter sat in her room listening to the conversations on her phone. And David, busy replacing the faucet, reported back about 40 minutes later. Mistress, accept the job. Lisa, who had listened to most of the conversation, returned his phone, went into the kitchen, tested the faucet, and was satisfied. Only the second faucet, for drinking water, was surprising. A satisfied David explained. From this faucet, you can drink the water immediately. The water goes through a purification system. Where's the system? I hid the system under the sink in the kitchen table, it's an unused space. That's right, you can't get in there. Now there's a system in there that purifies the water. There's a user manual on the table. Sit down at the table, and while I set the table, tell me what you're gonna do now. Nothing. I'm gonna get a divorce. That's what you call doing nothing? Where do you live now? In the garage for now. But that won't last long. 
I quit my job, we're downsizing. And he's already got a job elsewhere. They're sorting out the housing situation there, too. And where is that? Lisa, when I get settled, I'll be sure to invite you to visit. I'm not gonna tell you anything now. All you have to think about today is yourself and my grandson. Eat your meals, listen to quiet music. Read books out loud to him. Oh, Dad, the only books we have at home are basic programming. I don't know, maybe he'd be interested, too. In general, buy folk tales and read them yourself, so your grandson can hear your voice. Okay, agreed. And you, what are you going to do? Lisa, I'm a grown-up boy. After a short stay with his daughter, David went to the address given to him by Dima. He found Arthur there. They talked it over. Arthur's company performed major repairs of heating systems and gas equipment. And it was of high quality. Artur Fedorovic knew David, according to rumors, as a smart specialist and immediately offered him, after finishing the work in the kindergarten, to come to work for him, to the position of works producer. David replied. Arthur, I need to think this over. I don't feel like going to the city yet. After lunch, as promised, he came to Dima's house. Tyson had organized a small meeting. In general, being an excellent organizer, he was able to inspire people to feats. And at the end of the meeting, David was assured that on Friday before lunchtime, he would be presented with the agreed and approved project, a major overhaul of the heating system of the kindergarten, for 100 places. Elizabeth desperately searched all over the city for her husband. That he might be living in the garage had not occurred to her. Although she drove up there on Wednesday, there was a huge barn lock hanging on the door. She didn't know that David, in their last year together, had made the entrance to the garage from the back. The gate, on the other hand, opened from inside the garage. The barn lock hanging on the door played no role. That door wouldn't open. David was out of town on Wednesday. He moved some of his belongings to Diana's house that day. He had to meet with Petter to clarify the issue of payment for the project and, subsequently, payment for the builders. First he visited the SPK board, having solved all the issues, then he stopped by the kindergarten, picked up Sarah, and they drove home. That's where he unloaded the car. Sarah gave him a room on TH. E first floor. In order not to prolong the matter, David immediately agreed with her on the terms of his stay. That day he stayed overnight. In the meantime, Elizabeth, realizing that David would probably contact her daughter, decided to call her. Lisa answered quickly. Mom, I'm listening to you. Lisa, hi. Tell me, do you know where father is? That's it, mom. You haven't called me in almost a month. You know I'm going to have a baby soon, but you don't care. Daughter, I started with the most important thing for me today. I didn't call before so I wouldn't bother you. If I'd asked about your father, I would have asked how you were feeling. But it's important that I find my father today. He disappeared without telling anyone, without saying anything. Mom, he told people where he was and what was going on. But only people who didn't stab him in the back. And yes, Dad hasn't told anyone his new address. He doesn't want anyone accidentally telling you where to find him. I don't know his address either. He was at my place after your barbecue trip, and he told me everything. What could he have told you? I didn't have anything with Igor. Mom, I'm amazed you can lie so blatantly. Dad has an audio recording of your meeting on his phone, and I listened to it, and I was disgusted. Daughter, I don't know what audio he has, but it wasn't cheating. He also has a video that he took with his camera. From where? I believe he took it off himself, which leaves no doubt about what happened. If you're going to keep lying to me, we'd better end this conversation. No, daughter. I won't lie to you, tell me what daddy wants. Mom. He left you. Didn't you notice he took his stuff out of the house? Yeah, I noticed that. He left me a note promising to meet me and talk to me. That said, despite the shame I've been subjected to, I'm willing to forgive him, and I won't give him a divorce. As far as I'm concerned, he didn't promise a meeting. 
he promised to call. I just don't know how soon it'll be. You've hurt him very badly. You've spent your whole life thinking he was a sodomite and an ignoramus. I understand that, but how can I get him back? What do you need him for? He's just starting his life. What about me? You skipped it with what's his name, Igor. You found your soulmate, so live with him. Dad let you go. I don't want that bastard. He quit his job, and he said he was going to hand me over to another employee. Can you believe that? Like a baton. Mom. How old are you? Don't you realize that daddy was everything to you, and now you have nothing? Now, at your age, you have to look for someone who hasn't drunk. Normal men are already sorted out and living with normal wives. I'll tell you one thing, you lost your daddy. Friday afternoon David arrived in the village. Unloaded the second part of his tools and clothes. Sarah was at work. After unloading, he collected all the documents, put them in the car and drove to the board. Pyotr Semyonovich was there, solving some questions on the phone. David laid out the project in front of him and, armed with a stamp to produce the work, stamped all the sheets. Peter, followed by signing and dating. David said. I gave the photocopy to the contractor, they are dropping off on Sunday night. They start work on Monday. One question, is there somewhere we can put a crew of eight? Here are the keys to the clubhouse. We don't use it anyway, we've got beds and mattresses in the annex. There's enough for them. You'll get your bedding from the warehouse. Where did these beds come from? The students came here a long time ago. Form a squad. Sarah and David had dinner that evening. David put cognac and champagne on the table. He said. Now we can have a housewarming party. What, you're not going back to the city? Well, not unless it's for work. I go to work on Monday like everybody else. That's Monday, but tomorrow, what will you do? Tomorrow I'll do something around your house. And another thing, I saw you have a bathhouse. Yeah, good baths. Get up in the morning, pump the water and heat it up. It'll be hot by evening, you can go and have a steam. Aren't you taking a steam? I'll take a steam, too. Raya's coming to stay with us in the morning. Is she married? Almost. She's coming here with her fiancé. So the girls go first, then the boys. Then I'll run for a beer first thing in the morning. I think four liters will do. Why so much? Her fiancé doesn't drink. We should put a little more in the steam. Of course, but we don't have any alcohol in the store. It's a dry law for the harvesting season. In the morning, David started the car and drove into town. He wanted to pick up four liters of beer, but his eyes stopped on a five-liter keg of Heineken. When he got back, he pumped water into the tank and heated the stove in the bathhouse. Close to 11 o'clock, the gate slammed. A pretty girl and a man entered the courtyard. The girl greeted Sarah cheerfully and introduced her companion. And this is my Dennis. Nice to meet you. David, meet David. This is Dennis and my friend Raya. David said hello to Dennis without giving the impression that he already knew him. Dennis did the same. They walked into the house. Sarah seated the guests at the table and said to Raya. Today, you are my guests. And I won't let you go until tomorrow. The sauna will be ready now. Raisa and I are going to steam before it gets too hot. That's fine. While you're steaming, I'll prepare the meat for the kebab. I hope Dennis will help me. And now I suggest we have a few beers and a snack. We also brought beer and some wine. Dennis doesn't drink. A little alcohol wouldn't hurt him. Really, Dennis. We're at the table. David poured beer for everyone, saying. Wine after the sauna, for the kebabs. And there's cognac for the boys. After another hour, the girls went to the bathhouse. David and Dennis were left alone. Dennis, turning to David, said. Look, I'm sorry about the whole barbecue thing. 
It was just Michael, he was my boss, and I couldn't say no to him. And then he told me that Elizabeth had her eye on me. That I should get you drunk and put you to bed. I fell for it. I found out later that he'd been bullshitting me. Come on, forget it. Why don't you tell me if it's serious with Raya? Didn't we tell you? We applied at the registry office. When the registry office manager saw me with bruises, she asked me, young man, what's that? And Rika said it's nothing, he didn't want to go to the registry office. So? We just laughed. How'd you get the bruises? Don't you know? I drank a lot too much when I got you drunk. I fell asleep on a bench by the fountain. In the morning, Elizabeth and Michael, wrapped in sheets, walked into the enclosure and saw their clothes tied on the sculptures. And next to them on the bench, I'm sleeping. They figured it was my doing, and Michael had a good time. What did you say, Raya? Why the beatings? She was working, so she couldn't come with me. And I told her that we had a tournament and I lost it. I hope you won't talk about our meeting. Let's just say Elizabeth won't talk to me, and Michael quit. And by all means, I'll keep my mouth shut, but don't tell me how you screwed me over at the barbecue. Speaking of kebabs. I marinated the meat yesterday. So it won't be too much trouble. There's a barbecue in the yard. It's not far from the bathhouse. We'll flood it when we go to the bathhouse and make coals. While we're steaming, we'll put some wood on it a couple of times. As soon as we get out, we'll put the kebabs on the skewers. Tell me, what's going to happen with Tatiana? Divorce on grounds of infidelity. Isn't living with a woman also infidelity? Not exactly. I'm renting a corner from Diana. And we sleep in separate rooms. But I can't deny that I like her, and it's quite possible that we have a future together. Sarah is a beautiful woman, but paradise is better. You know, Dennis, as one poet and bard said, you can't argue about tastes, there are a thousand opinions. I've experienced this law myself. After all, even Einstein, the physical genius, had a very relative understanding of everything. I heard that somewhere. This song by Vysotsky, that's what it's called, you can't argue about tastes. The women came out of the bathhouse, wrapped in robes, with towels wrapped around their heads. They walked solemnly past David and Dennis and disappeared into the house. As they went, Sarah said. In about five minutes, you can go to the bathhouse. David heated the brazier, the flames quickly engulfed the dry wood, and called Dennis over. Let's go steam. Time flew by. David and Sarah grew closer. More and more often, in the evenings, their dinner conversations lengthened. The heating repair of the kindergarten was finished, and the heating system and water supply were checked for leaks by means of pressure increase. To carry out the pressurization work, they used pressure pumps. And one evening, when Sarah and David were having dinner, suddenly Lisa called and said, Dad, don't worry. Lisa, I'm calm. Dad, I'm supposed to be having a baby. You shouldn't be calling me, you should be calling an ambulance. No, it's okay, I'm already at the hospital. Did you tell your husband? Of course, he drove me to the hospital. The nurse says, sitting on the flower bed under the window. Lisa, don't worry, I know it's hard, but you'll get through it. How do you know? When mom gave birth to you, I also sat under the windows of the hospital. Speaking of mom. She called me after all. Well, it's just as you expected. She tried to blame everything on you. I'm glad you had the strength to leave her. Dad, she doesn't love you, and I'm totally on your side. That's it, Daddy, I love you, I think it's time to go into labor. Sarah said. We should get her a care package. The apples are good, and the pears are ripe. Berries are mostly gone but there are gooseberries, blueberries, and cranberries. Raspberries are in tea. He forest, and at the end of my vegetable garden. Are you suggesting we take a flashlight and go berry picking at night? Tomorrow's a day off, let's go to the woods in the morning. We'll pick mushrooms, and in the afternoon we'll go to our daughter's maternity ward. That's what they did. Sarah woke David in the dark, 
he started the car, and they drove into the woods. It was dawn by the time they got there. The place Sarah had indicated was a huge raspberry patch. She said. In the past, only big companies used to come here, afraid of bears. What about now? No bears. Gone. The hunters say that after the highway was built, they went a hundred kilometers away from our village. That's them in the heat of the moment. Civilization will catch up with them anyway. In the taiga, they even go out on the highway and beg. They spent a long time picking raspberries, echoing. But in the end, Sarah did not answer David's call again. He walked in the direction where she was supposed to be and saw her sitting quietly under a bush. Sarah noticed him and gestured for him to be quiet. When David looked where she pointed, he saw two healthy bears. They were outwardly peacefully picking raspberries. David took Sarah's hand and lifted her quietly, and they walked off in the direction of the abandoned car. When they saw that they had enough raspberries and mushrooms, they decided not to push their luck and left. Sarah noticed. I wondered who was sniffing like that, but the bears had come back. Back home, they had a quick snack, picked up groceries, fruit, put on a liter jar of wild raspberries and drove to the birthing center. By this time, David knew that Lisa had given birth to a boy and that she was doing well. In the afternoon, drove up to the birthing center. Sarah stayed in the car and David went to the station. Sarah got out of the car and was standing next to it when Elizabeth walked up to her and asked. Who are you? Me? Sarah. What happened? No, nothing. I'm David's wife, I saw that you came with him. Tell me, are you and him serious? Yes, we're serious. How long have you lived here? We don't live yet, although you could say we live under the same roof. How long? No. I met him the night he left your company barbecue. It must be fate. What does your husband tell you? I've never been married. Then it must be fate. I'll tell you what, take care of him. I know neither he nor my daughter will forgive me for my stupidity. Tell him to call me, and we'll work out the divorce. Good luck. Elizabeth turned and walked away. She had already given her daughter the program and had spoken to her on the phone since morning. At this time David came up, he saw his wife leaving. He asked. Sarah, did she hurt you? No, she told me to keep you safe and not to give you to anyone. I'm sorry. I should have known we'd run into her. There's nothing to apologize for. Honestly, though, meeting the bears and Molly Nick was much nicer. David called Elizabeth back, and they had a meeting at a cafe in town. Ironically, the highlight of the program was the kebabs. Elizabeth asked to be forgiven, and excusing herself said. You know, honestly, I don't even understand why I did it. I knew that Igarek was nothing, nothing of value. It was only when I came home and I didn't see you that I realized that everything that was good in life, I had lost. I'm not gonna fight the divorce. I've already fallen in my daughter's eyes, and my stubbornness will cause me to lose her. And you're not coming back. I wouldn't have forgiven you for that either. Eventually, David and Elizabeth divorced through the registry office. Neither he nor she made any property claims against each other. The civil registry office was not interested in the reason for the divorce. David continued to live with Diana under the same roof, and one day after the divorce, he proposed to Diana. They applied. Elizabeth was left to live alone. She tried dating, but the suitors didn't suit her. Some needed money, others were drinkers, others were married and interested in one-time, short-lived encounters. Vera, Michael's wife, had also found her happiness. Her brother organized a small picnic with shashliks in the yard of his cottage. His wife's older brother, who was single, was invited to the picnic. After meeting, they dated for about a year, and then he proposed to her, and she accepted. Michael, Vera's ex-husband after the divorce, managed to get a job as an engineer at a small private enterprise, with a small salary. The owner of the company had checked up on him at his old place of work. He warned him that he would not tolerate any shenanigans in the team. 
Eventually, Michael met a woman who lived with him in the same small apartment. She was divorced. They started dating and then living together, without registering their marriage. 